everybody. Um, welcome to the portion of our reactions unit where we are really putting everything together, where I'm going to ask you guys to look at some reactants, figure out what type of a reaction is taking place, predict those products, and determine their states of matter. So that's a lot, right? So step number one in this whole process is the first thing you guys need to do is you need to determine the reaction type. That's the key to this whole thing. And by determine reaction type, what I'm talking about here is, is this reaction single replacement, double replacement, synthesis, decomposition, that kind of thing. And if we wanna maybe make a little quick key off here to the right-hand side before we talk about the states of matter of the different products, um, we could do that real quick. Um, how do we identify a synthesis reaction? Well, those are real easy because if you have one element plus another element, if this is your situation, the only type of reaction that can happen is synthesis, where you have to put substance A and B together to make one thing. Okay, so that's always going to be synthesis. Element plus element. Now it is possible to have a compound plus another compound making a bigger compound. I will not give you that type of synthesis. Like you would need to know a little bit more chemistry in order to identify that. So any type of synthesis I'm gonna give you will be one element plus another element. Now, if you see the opposite of that, if you see one compound on the left breaking down, and it could be breaking down into any number of things, but maybe it's breaking down into the individual elements, this is a decomposition reaction. If you see one free element, with an ionic compound. One free element with an ionic compound. This is your single replacement. So you're gonna end up with A with C and B by itself, single replacement. If you see one compound ionic with another ionic compound, and they, they will also be aqueous, okay, so if you have two aqueous ionic compounds, switching their partners, A now being with D, and C now being with B, you've got yourself a double replacement reaction. And finally, if you have a carbon-hydrogen compound reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and H2O, you have a combustion reaction. So that's the first half of the battle, is just figure out what the reaction type is. Once you know the reaction type, then it is time to predict the products. Now, predicting the products and determining their states of matter is a little bit different depending on what things you're talking about. For example, if your products are elements, so like look here in this decomposition reaction, you could have an element or more than one element as a product. In a single replacement reaction, you could end up with an element as one of your products. It's important to remember that when you are breaking things up into their elements, that you don't forget your diatomic elements. Because sometimes you break things up into their elements, and one of those elements is diatomic. So like in the compound sodium chloride, chlorine, there's just one of them. But if you break it up, break it up into sodium and chlorine, that chlorine is now gonna be Cl2. So don't forget your diatomics. They are Brinkelhoff, okay? And if you like want an example of what I'm talking about there, for example, right, if you had sodium chloride, breaking up into sodium and chlorine. Chlorine is Cl2. Okay, that's what I mean by don't forget the diatomics. Here's the other thing you need to remember. To figure out your states of matter for your elements, you're going to check your periodic table. Now, depending on what periodic table you have, the color key might be slightly different. So solids tend to be black, but again, check yours just to be sure. 
Liquids tend to be blue. But gases, I think on my periodic table at school, um, gases are red, but I think on yours they might be green. So just double check the legend. But the state of matter will always be identified on the periodic table. So if I'm looking up here at sodium, sodium is a metal, so its state of matter is going to be solid. And chlorine, Cl2, didn't forget my Brinkelhoff, and chlorine on the periodic table is a gas. So when you're dealing with elements, I want you to not forget your diatomics, and I want you to check your periodic table for your states of matter. Now, of course, we need to balance this reaction overall, right? So I would need a two out in front of here in front of my sodium chloride. I would need a two out in front of here in front of my sodium. So that's obviously an important part of the process. And we're gonna talk next about how we know states of matter for ionic compounds. But I'll go ahead and do a little spoiler right here. The sodium chloride is a solid. Well, how do I know that? Moving on to talk about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are always one or two, one of two states of matter. Ionic compounds are either solid or aqueous. The reason why they tend to be solids, that's why my sodium chloride up here was a solid, is because ionic compounds form that crystal lattice structure, that very strong attraction between positive and negative ions, which leads them to being in a solid state at room temperature with very high melting points. However, if water is present and that salt has the ability to dissolve, it could be aqueous, okay? So in order to determine if an ionic compound is aqueous, number one, Water must be present. So like one of your reactants would already have to be aqueous. And the substance actually needs to be soluble. So you're gonna to need to check your solubility rules. The solubility rules is a list of rules that tell you whether or not an ionic compound can dissolve in water. Okay, so this is a list that tells us whether or not an ionic compound can dissolve in water. If it is insoluble, the state of matter will be solid. If it is soluble and there is water present for it to dissolve in, the substance will be aqueous. So that's how we're gonna determine our state of matter for these ionic compounds. We are going to assume that they are solids if there's no water present. If there is water present, we're gonna check our solubility rules. Now, one other thing about ionic compounds, when we are predicting products for ionic compounds, let's look at the types of reactions that, that could happen in. We could be synthesizing an ionic compound. In a single replacement reaction, we make ionic compounds. And in double replacement reactions, we make ionic compounds. So this happens a lot. Double replacement, single replacement, and synthesis. Whenever you are making an ionic compound, you have to balance your charges. We do not just smush the subscripts together, right? So for example, like the demo that I did for you guys, if I have a piece of magnesium and I heat it, in the presence of oxygen, it does not just smush together to make MgO2. That's not what happens. Magnesium makes a two plus charge and oxygen makes a two minus, and this is my formula. So I must balance my charges. Let's balance the reaction overall with a two out in front here and a two out in front there. And then lastly, I need my states of matter. Magnesium is a metal and is a solid. We know that oxygen is a gas. 
and my ionic product here. Remember, this product is either going to be solid or aqueous. In order to be aqueous, there must be water present. Neither one of my reactants are aqueous, meaning there's no water present anywhere in this reaction. And so if there's no water present, this is definitely going to be a solid. Okay, so you're putting a lot together. You have to figure out the correct formula for the substance, and then you have to figure out its state. But luckily, that only leaves us one other type of compound, and that would be covalent compounds. Covalent compounds, we do not balance charges, okay? If we're trying to figure out the products in covalent compounds, we're going to need to use observations. Did that water look like liquid water, or was it coming off as steam? We're going to have to do tests on the gases to figure out, was that hydrogen gas being produced or was it oxygen gas being produced? Covalent compounds are a little bit trickier to figure out because we are not balancing our charges. So in terms of figuring out their, their formulas, we're going to have to do some laboratory testing. To figure out their states of matter, again, we're going to use some observations and we're going to also use some common sense. Like there are states of matter that you just already know. For example, you know that water at room temperature is a liquid, but if there was a lot of heat going on in the reaction, that water is going to come off as a gas. You guys know that CO2 is a gas. You know from all of the demos that we did that hydrogen peroxide, if it's given to you as 3%, that means it's been dissolved in water, so its state of matter is aqueous. Okay, so you're going to just have to use a little bit of common sense in combination with your observations in the lab to figure out not only what is this substance, but what state of matter is it going to be in. And that's it. Easy, right? Figure out your reaction type. Figure out what products get made. If they are elements, remember your diatomics and check your periodic table for your state of matter. If your products are ionic, balance your charges and check your solubility rules. And if any of your products are covalent, do some more laboratory testing to figure out their identity and use some common sense along with those observations to figure out their state of matter. You'll get a lot of practice with this in the lab. Good luck.